Welcome to Signature Bank's 2020 fourth quarter and fiscal year end results conference call. Hosting the call today from Signature Bank are Joseph J. DiPaolo, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Eric R. Howell, Senior Executive Vice President, Corporate and Business Development. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, all participants have been placed in a listen-only mode and the floor will be open for your questions following the presentation. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. If at any point your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. We ask that you please pick up your handset to allow optimal sound quality. Lastly, if you should require operator assistance, please press star 0. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Joseph J. DiPaolo, President and Chief Executive Officer. You may begin. Thank you, Lori. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the Signature Bank 2020 fourth quarter and year-end results conference call. Before I begin my formal remarks, Susan Lewis will read the forward-looking disclaimer. Please go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Joe. This conference call and oral statements made from time to time by our representatives contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 that are subject to risks and uncertainties. You should not place undue reliance on those statements because they are subject to numerous risks and uncertainties relating to our operations and business environment, all of which are different to predict and may be beyond our control. Forward-looking statements include information concerning our future results, interest rates in the interest rate environment, loan and deposit growth, loan performance, operations, new private client team hires, new office openings, business strategy, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on each of the foregoing and on our business overall. As you consider forward-looking statements, you should understand that these statements are not guarantees of performance or results. They involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements. These factors include those described in our quarterly and annual reports filed with the FDIC, which you should review carefully for further information. You should keep in mind that any forward-looking statements made by Signature Bank speak only as of the date on which they were made. Now I'd like to turn the call back to Joe. Thank you, Susan. I will provide some overview into the quarterly and annual results, and then Eric Howell, our CEVP of Corporate and Business Development, will review the bank's financial performance in greater detail. Eric and I will address your questions at the end of our remarks. Signature Bank continues to experience extraordinary growth during the country's protracted and challenging recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our business philosophy of a client-centric, single point of contact model led by experienced group directors continues to distinguish us particularly in times of distress. Additionally, the bank has an accelerating, multifaceted growth profile with traditional private client banking teams leading the charge in New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Further fortifying the bank's market position are a multitude of national businesses, including Signature Financial, Asset-Based Lending, fund banking, venture banking, digital banking, including Signet, and specialized mortgage banking solutions. The collective strength of our franchise led to an unbelievable quarter of record deposit growth, record loan growth, record pre-tax pre-provision earnings, and record net income. We look forward to a healthier 2021 as recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic commences. Now let's take a look at earnings. Let's take a close look at earnings. Pre-tax pre-provision earnings for the 2024 quarter were $261.5 million, an increase of $45 million or 21% compared with $216.3 million for the 2019 fourth quarter. Net income for the 2024 quarter was a record $173 million, or $3.26 diluted earnings per share, compared with $147.6 million, or $2.76 diluted earnings per share, reported in the same period last year. 
The increase in income was predominantly driven by substantial asset growth of $23.3 billion, offset by the investments we made in new businesses, including our West Coast expansion. Looking at deposits, deposits increased a record $9 billion, or 16.5% to $63.3 billion this quarter, while average deposits grew a record $10.4 billion. For the year, deposits increased a record $22.9 billion, and average deposits increased a record $12.5 billion. Non-interest-bearing deposits of $18.8 billion represent a high 30% of total deposits. Our deposit and loan growth led to a record increase of $23.3 billion, or 46%, in total assets for the year, which reached nearly $74 billion. Now, let's take a look at our lending businesses. Core loans, or loans excluding PPP, during the 2024 quarter increased a record $2.7 billion, or 6.2%, to $47 billion. For the year... Core loans grew a record $7.8 billion, or 20%. The increase in loans this quarter was again driven primarily by new fund banking capital core facilities. This is the ninth consecutive quarter where CNI outpaced CRE growth, furthering the rapid transformation of the balance sheet to include more floating rate assets as we continue to diversify our portfolio. Non-accrual loans were $120 million, or 25 basis points of total loans, compared with $81 million, or 18 basis points for the 2020 third quarter. Our 30 to 89-day pass-through loans increased to $234.9 million. It is important to note that $88.3 million of the 30 to 89-day pass-throughs were caused by processing and documentation delays given COVID-19 circumstances, and we are now current. Our 90-day-plus pass-through loans remained very low at $5.8 million. Now, charge-offs for the 2024 quarter were $11.4 million, or 10 basis points, compared with $10.5 million for the 2023rd quarter. The provision for credit losses for the 2024 quarter was $35.6 million, compared with $52.7 million for the 2023rd quarter. This brought the bank's allowance for credit losses to 1.04%, and the coverage ratio stands at a healthy 423%. I would like to point out that if we took if we look, excuse me, at the ACL ratio, excluding very well secured fund banking loans and government guaranteed PPP loans, it would be much higher at 1.41%. Turning to modifications, as of December 31, 2020, the bank has entered into COVID-19 principal and interest modifications of 1.3 billion or 2.7%. Of that balance, $107 million remain as short-term modifications. We fully anticipate that we will have increased non-accrual loans and charge-offs in the coming quarters due to the effect of COVID. But given the level of our allowance for credit losses, where we prudently doubled the allowance, adding $258 million since the adoption of CECL, we believe we are adequately covered for what may come. Now onto the greatly expanding team front where we had much success. In 2020, we added a total of 20 private client banking teams, two in New York, five in San Francisco, and 13 in the greater Los Angeles area, marking our entry into the Southern California marketplace. The bank now has a total of 116 private client banking teams, of which 23 are located on the West Coast. At this point, I'll turn the call over to Eric, and he will review the quarter's financial results in greater detail. Thank you, Joe, and good morning, everyone. I'll start by reviewing net interest income and margin. 
Net interest income for the fourth quarter reached $395 million, an increase of $6.3 million from the 2020 third quarter. Net interest margin for the quarter declined 32 basis points to 2.23% compared with 2.55% for the 2020 third quarter. The entire decrease and then some was due to excess cash balances from significant deposit flows, which impacted margin by 46 basis points. Let's look at asset yields and funding costs for a moment. Interest earning asset yields for the 2024 quarter decreased 41 basis points from the linked quarter to 2.75%. The decrease in overall asset yields was again driven by the excess average cash balances, which grew from $5.6 billion to $12.5 billion during the quarter. Additionally, asset yields continue to be affected by lower reinvestment rates in all of our asset classes. Yields on the securities portfolio decreased 46 basis points linked quarter to 2.13% due to the decline in market rates as well as the bank investing in floating rate securities and our portfolio duration remained low at 2.2 years. Turning to our loan portfolio, Yields on average commercial loans and commercial mortgages decreased six basis points to 3.6% compared with the 2023rd quarter. This was mostly due to lower origination yields. And excluding prepayment penalties from both quarters, yields decreased by four basis points. Now looking at liabilities, our overall deposit costs this quarter decreased nine basis points to 42 basis points due to the low interest rate environment. We anticipate this downward trend to continue in 2021. During the quarter, average borrowing balances decreased by $744 million to $3 billion. The overall cost of funds for the quarter decreased nine basis points to 57 basis points, driven by the reduction in deposit costs and decreased average borrowings, which was slightly offset by the addition of subordinated debt with a 4% coupon. On to non-interest income and expense. Non-interest income for the 2024 quarter was $24.2 million, an increase of $8.2 million, or 51% when compared with the 2019 fourth quarter. The increase is mostly due to a rise of $5.5 million in fees and service charges, as well as an increase of $2.4 million in trading income. Non-interest expense for the 2024 quarter was $157.7 million versus $138 million for the same period a year ago. The $19.6 million, or 14% increase, was principally due to the addition of new private client banking teams. And despite our significant team hirings and margin compression from significant cash balances, the banks actually gained operating leverage, and as a result, our efficiency ratio improved to 37.6% for the 2024 quarter versus 39% for the comparable period last year and 38.9% for the 2020 third quarter. And turning to capital, uh, during the quarter, the bank successfully raised $730 million in non-cumulative perpetual Series A preferred stock, which qualifies as Tier 1 capital. Additionally, the bank issued $375 million in subordinated debt, which qualifies as Tier 2 capital. All capital ratios remained well in excess of regulatory requirements and augment the relatively low risk profile of the balance sheet, as evidenced by a Tier 1 leverage ratio of 8.55% and a total risk base ratio of 13.54% as of the 2024 quarter. And finally, the bank paid a cash dividend of 56 cents per share of common stock. And now I'll turn the call back to Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. I'd like to thank my colleagues, a number of who, who are listening on the call today, who have demonstrated their dedication to our clients and their needs during this pandemic. Times like these, our clients truly value the level of care and advice that my colleagues provide, and our performance for the year reflects their extraordinary efforts and the strength of our franchise as we continue to execute on many 
many fronts. 2020 was truly a remarkable year of growth and achievement for Signature Bank. On the deposit front, which is our key metric, we delivered unbelievable record deposit growth of 23 billion or 57%. And we reduced the cost of deposits from a high of 121 basis points in Q3 2019 to 42 basis points at year end with room for further reductions. Demand deposits increased to record 5.7 million, excuse me, 5.7 billion for the year and remain at a high 30% of total deposits. And most importantly, our deposit growth came across the board from our existing teams to all of our new businesses. There were literally 26 traditional banking teams in New York that grew over 100 million each. Our newly established teams on the West Coast grew over 1 billion. The Specialized Mortgage Banking Solutions team grew over $3.5 billion. The Venture Banking Group grew nearly $1 billion, and our Digital Banking team grew uh, over $8 billion in deposits. We have clearly distinguished ourselves as the predominant bank in the digital space. Turning to loans. We had record core loan growth of nearly $8 billion, driven by another of our new businesses, the Fund Banking Division, which delivered nearly $7 billion in loan growth. Additionally, Signature Financial had another strong year and surpassed $5 billion in outstanding loans, the ranks as the 15th largest bank lender in this space. A truly remarkable accomplishment for that team. Congratulations, guys. Furthermore, as planned, we held our commercial real estate loan balances flat over the last two years and made great strides in reducing our CRA, CRE concentration to 376% from 551% at year-end 2018. Looking at earnings, the bank's pre-tax pre-provision earnings grew by 136 million or 16% for the year and we had a strong ROE of 10.75% despite a heavy amount of provisioning and margin compression due to excess cash balances. Fee income or non-interest income grew by 22% or $13.5 million for the year and several of our fee income initiatives are just starting to take hold. Additionally, we improved our already best-in-class efficiency ratio during the year 37.6%. On the capital front, we meaningfully improved our capital position by over $1 billion with the issuance of $375 million in subordinated debt and $730 million in preferred stock. Moreover, we maintained our dividend while turning off our buyback program to support the tremendous level of growth. And most importantly, we set the stage for future growth with the hiring of 20 private client banking teams and the opening of five new offices in the Los Angeles marketplace. Everything we said we would do this year, we did. Everything we said we would do this year, we did. Our growth for 2020 was equivalent to acquiring a top 50 bank, but we did it organically and without expending shareholder value. Signature Bank enters 2020 as a strong financial institution, and we very much look forward to the years to come. Now we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Lori, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. The floor is now opened for questions. At this time, if you have a question or a comment, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. If at any point your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. Again, we do ask that while you pose your question that you pick up your handset to provide optimal sound quality. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Zerbe of Morgan Stanley. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, morning Ken. Uh, um, fantastic deposit growth this quarter. I mean, just downright stunning. Um, but I guess my question on the deposit growth, are you guys earning a positive spread on the new deposits coming in? No, that, that's, that's, that's the issue. We have to deploy it, and we have to deploy it quickly. 
So when the new deposits are coming in, even though they're coming in uh, at a much lower cost than we had uh, just recently, uh, we're still not making a spread. And that's clearly affecting our net interest margin. Uh, but this this is a trade-off that we'll take every time. You know, we've been through cycles before. We've been through rising rate environments before. And when rates rise, we will see the deposit growth moderate. Um, but what we'll also see is continued loan growth. And we'll, we'll have, we have the deposits now to fund the substantial loan growth that we have in the future. Um, so we're loaded for bear. And this is the, a very high-class problem for us to have, Ken. Yeah, Ken, we, we, we are taking uh, market share, like for instance, with the mortgage servicing, specialized mortgage servicing team. Uh, they grew by three and a half billion this year. Uh, that's market share that they're taking and we're getting an opportunity to bring the business in. So uh, we'll take it all day and deploy it later. Yeah, I guess, um, I think, like I said, it's your, the quarter was very awesome in my view, but I guess, I guess with the negative spread that you're getting, I mean, it just, like, I, I could see how you would gain share by paying a much higher rate than the market is currently paying. So the question is just, like, do you feel that you have to keep paying this elevated yield on your new deposits? It seems like there might be some room to lower your new deposit yields that you're offering and, and still definitely more than support your loan growth. Yes, we, we, um, we, we had 42 basis points cost in the quarter, for the fourth quarter. The month of December was down to 41 basis points, and in January thus far, we're at 37 basis points. So we're continuing to bring the, the, uh, the rate down. Um, we'll, we'll be uh, probably in the mid to low 30s uh, by the end of the quarter. So we brought it down nine basis points in the fourth quarter. There's no reason why we can't bring it down nine basis points or more in the in the first quarter of 2021. Got it. Okay. And then maybe maybe just switching gears a little bit, um, Joe. I think you mentioned that you do expect higher net charge offs over time, which is a very reasonable expectation. But one of the concerns around signatures has just been you know the potential for you know significant lost content in the CRE portfolio. Can you guys help quantify when you say higher charge offs? Like, what exactly are you thinking when you say that? Thank you. Well, what we're not seeing what, what we're saying and what, what's happening is not necessarily meeting. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, we're, we're not seeing uh, charge offs uh, right now coming through. We, we expect it to be more than it had been in the last couple of years, which was pretty negligible. But we, our clients are just not handing back the keys. Uh, we've had some charge-offs in the last two quarters, and they've been uh, some CRE retail. But uh, with, the court, with the CARES Act, uh, a lot of the clients are saying, uh, I have an opportunity to get by during the pandemic and then start paying again. And that's why we're, we're not seeing a lot of charge-offs. But we expect it to be higher than it had been in 2018, 2019, which I said was pretty negligible. Yeah, in fact, we've, we've challenged our team to get ahead of this, to find the bad credits now, to identify them and to deal with them. And quite frankly, we're just not finding them. Now, our clients uh, see their properties, their businesses as their livelihood in the future. They're not at a point where they want to give up. Um, with, with the vaccines and the, the news of the vaccines, more vaccines on the horizon, uh, the, the potential stimulus that will come from the new administration, um, you know, gives them a lot of positive, um, you know, uh, uh, things to look forward to in the future, and it's just giving them less reason to want to give up. Um, so, you know, as much as we're looking for the charge-offs um, and we're anticipating we'll have them, they're just not coming to fruition. I mean, we've doubled our allowance to over half a billion to, during this year, so we're certainly well prepared for it. All right, that's no, good to hear. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Our next question comes from the line of Dave Rochester of Compass Point. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning, morning Dave. Dave. 
Hey, on the, the NIM or the NII outlook, whichever I guess is easier to talk about, I uh, was wondering what your thoughts were there just following the curve steepening we've seen recently and then your outlook on the deposit cost there that you mentioned being in the, the low to mid-30s at some point. And then maybe as a part of that outlook, you guys obviously have a ton of cash in the balance sheet. I uh, was just curious to hear your thoughts on how fast you're willing to deploy that into securities and then how much more in the way of borrowing you can pay down for this year. Yeah, there's a little bit more. I'll take the latter part first. There's a little bit more in borrowings to, to pay, but not a substantial amount. Um, you know, so we won't see too much of the savings uh, there, Dave. Um, you know, we do, as Joe pointed out, we hope to get the deposit cost down another nine basis points or so, and we'll be in the, in the mid to low 30s um, come quarter end. Um, certainly we have, uh, you know, ability to deploy on the asset side. Um, we can really put one to two billion dollars per quarter to work in the securities portfolio, and another one to two billion per quarter to work on the loan side. So we're going to have two to four billion in asset growth. I mean, that's that's a little bit easier for us to predict. The hard part is the deposit flows. Um, you know, thus far this quarter it's slowed down a little bit, but we still have growth. Um, we certainly don't anticipate eight billion dollars worth of deposit flows. Uh, you know, this coming quarter, but we, we expect it to continue to happen, um, which is great, you know. Um, so all that being said, the NII will be up, and that, that much we can predict, um, you know, and, and it should be up pretty pretty nicely. The NIM is impossible at this point to predict because of the, the, uh, the nature of the deposit flows, and it's hard to say, um, you know, if more are going to come in, if we'll be able to make a meaningful impact to all the cash that we're sitting on but we should have yep. some pretty substantial NII growth. That makes sense. So when you're talking about one to two billion in securities growth a quarter and one to two billion in loan growth a quarter, is that right? So That's you're right. getting two to four billion in asset growth a quarter, or you cap that at three billion just for capital concerns, or, or what are your thoughts? No, I mean, we're not concerned about capital. We, we have ample ability uh, to drive capital generation through earnings. Um, we earn, you know, 13.5%. Uh, return on, on on common equity this quarter. So the earnings is there. We get to a normalized provision, and I think we're we're going to get there relatively soon. That gives us even more earnings power. Like I said, I, I don't think the deposit growth is going to be quite as robust as it was all of last year. So so we'll have a little bit less growth there. So so earnings should really be supportive um, of our of our growth, and we feel uh, very comfortable where we are on the capital front. Right, and where are you seeing asset pricing today, just on securities? I know you said you're still doing some of those floaters, which are sometimes lower yielding, and then uh, on the capital call lines, where are those pricing these days? On the capital call lines, uh, the pricing has become a little tighter, but uh, it's it's libel based, and where it's become tighter is on the on the uh, the floor, because we like to have a floor, you know, 50 basis points or thereabouts. And that's becoming uh, tighter, but it, it, the pricing is anywhere from LIBOR 150 to LIBOR 225. Yeah, and okay. on, the security, on the security side, you know, the floating rate uh, securities that we're putting on are anywhere from 40 to 60 basis points, uh, and then you know, other investments are you know, in, in the high ones, I'd say. So blended, we're probably coming in a little bit over 1% on security reinvestment. We're, we're still being selective on the on the long side. Um, as we do anticipate, rates will continue to rise, at least on the, on, on the longer back end of the curve. And, yep. and, and for the first quarter, we're going to have the PPP loans. Uh, thus far, for the last two days, we have a little bit more than 2,000 applications and exceeding $600 million. So we have we've deployed a significant number of personnel be ready to, to get the applications in, into the system and have the SBA give us an SBA number so the, the, the process is done. And uh, we hope to get up to a billion, if not more. Yeah, sounds good. Maybe just one last one real quick on the deposit side. I know you guys bank cryptocurrency firms. I'm just wondering if you could talk about what you do for these guys. And I know you mentioned the strong deposit growth in digital uh, that's that's been a nice positive to the story. I was just curious, you know, how big of a chunk of that is coming from you know, crypto customers, and then what your outlook is for growth in that segment. 
Um, well, you know, there's there's a number of different uh, types of clients, whether it's stablecoin or OTC desks or digital asset exchanges or you know, blockchain type tech companies and others that we bank in that space. So, um, you know, we have approaching, I think we're just crossed over $10 billion in deposits with our, with our digital asset team. So it's been a very solid area of growth. We've, you know, clearly become the preeminent player in that space. So, so we're very excited about what's happening there. Um, you know, it's, it's obvious that, that uh, you know, digital assets and cryptocurrencies are not going away, and there's something in the future. We're not sure who the winners and losers are going to be, but we're very happy that we're, um, you know, the bank uh, for all those various firms. And uh, what helps there is the Signet platform that we, uh, that we uh, announced on uh, January 1st, 2019. Uh, very exciting, uh, 24 by 7 by 365. The team that handles that does continuous enhancements. And uh, there's a world beyond cryptocurrencies where we can uh, have uh, another, other ecosystems using the uh, platform. So it's, it's very exciting. It's one of the areas, one of the few areas where we're, we're staying ahead of the pack and not being a follower, but being a leader technologically wise. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the color. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Our next question comes from the line of Ibrahim Punawala of Bank of America Securities. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Ibrahim. Ibrahim. I guess, uh, Eric, just in terms of expense outlook, you previously talked about just expense growth uh, uh, generally in terms of uh, a quarterly basis, peaking out maybe early part of the year. So give us some color on expense growth and how that translates into operating leverage and efficiency ratio based on what you see for the year. Yeah, you know, we anticipate hiring a, a reasonable number of teams early on in the year, probably 10 to 15 teams, but not the 20 teams that we hired uh, in 2020. So um, we should see our expenses really start out in that 14, maybe 15% range, but hopefully we keep it to 14% and then trend down slowly over the, the course of the year. Um, you know, we, we gained operating leverage this year, right? Uh, even though, you know, we had a declining uh, NIM, we were sitting on a, on a ton of cash. We hired 20 teams. Um, so, you know, we have a very uh, powerful model that can really drive um, net income, right? And, and, and we have some leverage yet in our infrastructure. So we should see positive operating leverage, especially as we put the cash to work and have more on the earnings side. I think we'll, we'll be able to keep uh, expenses uh, in check and gain efficiencies. Got it. And on the cash, uh, going back to this, uh, the negative carry, $12.5 billion in the fourth quarter. From what I have, I, I think you said previously that you see that number should be maybe about 2 to $3 billion where you feel the cash position should be adequate. So is it fair to assume that there's about nine to 10 billion that you will be deployed towards loans and securities over the next few quarters? Uh, just how do you think about that? Uh, I think it's gonna take us a little bit more than a few quarters, but yes, absolutely. We, we should have $10 billion flowing into, into interest earning assets over the course of this year, at least. And that number doesn't stay static because more deposits are gonna to continue to come in. Right, right. And uh, I'm not sure if you're able to disclose, but uh, going back to the earlier question around bringing in deposits at maybe marginally higher rates than what the market offers, like I'm assuming the new deposits that are coming in are fairly much lower than the low to mid thirties where you expect the total cost of deposits going through. Any, any color around that? And just talk to us, Eric, in terms of why it is worth paying up for these deposits in terms of what franchise value these add in the near term and over time for Signature. Well, like an, uh, an example, the mortgage servicing, uh, specialized mortgage servicing team, uh, they bring in on a daily basis a uh, tremendous number of accounts of DDA non-interest bearing. And then some of the, some of the escrows that, that are big dollars that stay, uh, that flow in and out much less frequently, uh, we're paying right now in the 30%, 30 basis point range. 
Uh, but when you combine the two, 30 and then the DDA, you, you're coming down below 30. Uh, so uh, I think everyone focuses on NIM, but the real, real place to focus is on the efficiency because we're a lot more efficient bringing these deposits in than a retail group. A retail group will have a much lower deposit cost, but they will have high real estate costs high marketing and high advertising costs, but we don't have that. So that, that bodes well for the efficiency ratio. Uh, but we have a lot of room. Like I said uh, earlier, we brought the cost down to 37 basis points from 41 basis points in December through to January now. So th in one month, we're down four basis points, and we continue to drive it down further. Uh, we don't have that retail component so we don't have the expense, but we also don't have the retail component where we can drop the uh, rates uh, as uh, quickly as uh, you would for the large clients that we have in our portfolio. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. And just one quick one, Eric, uh, uh, just the outlook for tax rate for the year. Uh, you know, I'd use 28%. We had some one-time, you know, state tax true-ups uh, as we filed those returns. So. Uh, that brought our rate down, and we're we're a little bit higher than we probably should have been earlier in the year. So um, we should get back to a 20 28 percent effective tax rate for next year, barring any changes, obviously, taxes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jared Shaw of Wells Fargo. Hi. Good morning, guys. Morning, Jared. Um, you know, maybe first. Going back to Signet and the growth in digital, and you know that's that's great deposit growth. Can you can you share with us how else there's what other ways can you monetize those relationships? Um, and I'm you know looking at the fee income line as well. You know up almost 40% this quarter. Is that a is that a level we can see growth from? And is that dependent upon or or conditioned upon uh, Signet as well? Or or how should we be thinking about other ways of monetizing beyond just deposit balances? Well, the the digital clients. Um, right now are, are generating very little fee income. Uh, we're improving our foreign exchange system to the point that the digital clients will be using foreign exchange quite a bit. So the team that handles that is waiting for the improvements to happen in, in, in our FX system and we can drive some foreign exchange there. But a Signet drives really deposits uh, right now, we're not charging fees and getting the new ecosystems on, uh, and we will probably won't uh, spot fee income on Signet for some time until we get a, a large uh, amount of uh, ecosystems on there. So the fee income that's being driven right now uh, in our institution is, is non-digital. Right, and we certainly, you know, we're, we're, we're pleased with the growth that we've seen uh, in the fee income a lot of that's coming from the new teams that we brought on board, whether it's you know the mortgage banking team, which is pretty fee intensive, or venture, or the fund banking team, which generates a lot of unutilized fees. Um, you know, Joe talked about foreign exchange. Um, that you know we're putting a new system in place um, that should help us to to really bolster profits there. Um, and and you know all the new groups that we've added, and in particular the West Coast, will really benefit. From better foreign exchange capabilities, so that's that's a way for us to continue to drive fee income. We're working on a new credit card uh, for us to issue. We'll need that for the West Coast as well as our venture team. So that hopefully will come out mid-year, and we'll start to see some revenues uh, generated from that. Um, our trade finance group, we continue to build that out, um, and starting to see some nice traction gain there. Um, and really, we're, you know, we're talking to our bankers more. And telling them that you know what we provide um, an unbelievable level of service to our clients, um, and we certainly saw that play out in this in this current environment, where other you know some of our clients would tell us I couldn't even get a banker on the phone at X Y Z Bank, right? Well, we need to be paid for that, right? The fact that we've got a team that is there all the time for their clients' needs, we need to get paid for that. So we're focusing on that with our banking teams, and that also will hopefully drive revenues. Okay, that's, that's great color, thanks. And then I guess shifting to, to credit, um, 
you know, obviously, you know, you, you sound optimistic when you're talking about the, the loss content and the potential losses and the and the loans that you're working with the borrowers on here. Maybe can you can you share with us, you know, as you've gone through, you know, year end and you you did the modifications and the the second round of deferrals. Um, you know, I guess why do you feel that that confidence, whether it's in the loan to value or debt service coverage ratios or or or, or vacancies? Um, you know, maybe just give us an update on on sort of the strength of that underlying portfolio and where you're you're getting that that confidence from. It's somewhat everything you said, but added on top on top of that is that in the commercial real estate world, we deal with these multi generational, high net worth families that uh, do deals with other partners that are multi generational, high yield, high earning families, and uh, they want to keep the buildings, particularly the multifamily, in their portfolios. And they've stepped up when they've had to. And that gives us the confidence that the type of clients that we have are not a client that has one building that relies on that one building for their livelihood. Uh, we, we have uh, these large clients that have multiple buildings that, you know, some may be hurting but most are not, and they're able to take care of. What gives us confidence also is that on the deferrals, the fact that they're not paying us on a, on a, on a principal and interest deferral, they still have operating costs. They have the cost to operate the building. They're still paying taxes. They're paying insurance. So that gives us confidence that when the pandemic starts to subside, that they'll have the cash flow when rents start moving up, to pay to pay the uh, interest-only piece and then to pay the principal and interest piece for the third uh, leg of the uh, of the deferral, uh, they just don't want to give up on uh, on keeping uh, their properties. I think what's different now than any of the cycles in the past is that we have the CARES Act and the banks can be more flexible for them. And it's more of a timing issue than it is a cycle. And then that's great color, thanks. And then I guess um, you know when you look at that second round of of PPP, um, are you going to be really able to target it to those uh, to those borrowers that that may need it the most? Or you know I guess how how important is that second round of of PPP to the uh, the loans that are already in deferral or, or modification? They, they, they're really not, they're really separate. Um, I think the PPP is going to help them, but it's not going to help them pay their uh, their loans. It's going to help them uh, pay the employees so that, 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 that they can survive uh, while the pandemic is going on. I think it's more of a humanistic piece than it is paying for the rent. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matthew Breeze of Stephen Zink. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. Hey, Matt. Following up on the credit question, so the the 6.6 percent of loans that weren't you know full P and I deferrals, could you just provide us with the composition, the LTVs, and the types of modifications being provided there? And what was that balance last quarter? I'm not sure what the balance was last quarter, but you know, it, it, uh, it's those are predominantly interest-only loans where we modified into an interest-only structure. Uh, mind, you know, what our LTVs were on the entire portfolio. You know, mid-50 uh, on an LTV, one, 125 to 145 on a debt service coverage. Uh, I mean, those. Those those loans we're really not concerned about. You know, the clients are paying this interest only or interest only plus partial principal, so um, you know, not overly concerned. Okay, and that debt service coverage was a you know as of most recent or at the time of underwriting? No, at the time of underwriting. Okay, understood. Um, the second question was just on loan growth uh, for this year. Uh, in 2020, fund banking was the primary driver, and you know I recognize the team is still fairly new, fairly new. I'm just curious, how much of the growth this year was driven by the teams recapturing old customers versus general private equity market tailwinds? And then looking ahead, how much do you think the fund banking division will contribute to loan growth uh, in 2021? What other verticals will grow? 
Well, I think the fund banking team will still lead. Uh, we'll have a signature financial, which is past five billion in outstanding, probably somewhere between four and five hundred million. We'll have four or five hundred million in growth. Uh, the venture group could probably have somewhere upwards of uh, one to four hundred million. Um, we have then um, uh, the teams in Los Angeles and San Francisco are really purely uh, traditional CNI teams, and we expect several hundred million in growth there. Uh, the PPP loans will will discount because we don't know how long they'll they'll stay on. The fund banking division could do probably anywhere between a billion to a billion and a half a quarter. And then we have two initiatives that we're discussing right now to bring on two verticals that will be uh, asset generators. We haven't disclosed what they are uh, because we're still bring, we're in the midst of bringing them on board, but they'll contribute in the second half of the year on the asset side. Okay, understood. And just to be clear, the signature financial, 400 to 500, the VC, um, you know, that's all on a, on a quarterly basis, not for the year, correct? No, that's for a year. That's for, that's for the year. Okay, with fund banking doing a billion to a billion and a half a quarter. Right. Okay. So like signature financial, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot more short term. So they have to overcome a lot of the amortization. Uh, they they could be doing several billion, but it's net four to five hundred million. Okay. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the last one was just on um, uh, on digital and, and Signet banking deposits. You know, as, as you wind back the tape and you look at when you first hired the digital banking team, you mentioned catering to the institutional investors playing in that space. It was a different time for crypto back then. I, I think folks were much more skeptical. Can you just talk a little bit about how sentiment, adoption, investing in crypto, crypto, how, how appetite and interest from the institutional investors changed over the past couple of years, but really over, over this year, and, and what the growth opportunity for this line of business could be? Well, it's, it's growing by leaps and bounds. Um, we are doing, we, we, we were only taking institutional deposits in this space, and in fact, that's pretty much what we're doing. Uh, but for the exchanges, um, with the top five exchanges we have as clients, we're allowing for some retail uh, funds flow, and we're doing enhanced compliance. Now, these exchanges have been given licenses by the state, but the regulators are starting to regulate the business, and we're only doing it with five some retail, but for the most part, we're still institutional, and it just keeps on growing by leaps and bounds. I think what, what drove it, in part, is the pandemic. Right, and with that, did you see enhanced or, or uh, you know, outsized growth on the back half of the year than the first half? Yeah, it's likely, yeah. I, I would agree with that. We would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop there. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Alexopoulos of J.P. Morgan. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Alice, good, I mean, uh, Stephen, good morning. So uh, just to start, so the 6.6% .6 of loans that are COVID-19 modified, it, it's still not clear to me what's exactly in that bucket. Are, th are those loans on deferral or are they not on deferral? Those are loans that were modified to an predominantly modified to an interest only structure. So there's loans that are on full payment deferral, the PI full payment deferral, that's the one point three billion that we disclose in the table. And then there's other loans that were modified to an interest only structure. Okay, so essentially they are being deferred, right? I mean at least principal payments being deferred. Right. Principal is right. being oh. deferred. That's right. Principles being deferred, and, and Eric, what's the term of these? Like, how long are the are you providing these deferrals for? Somewhere be, uh, anywhere between six and twelve months. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So well, what they're what doing I, is the ones that paying the ones yeah. that are paying interest only are paying their insurance, they're paying their their operating costs, and they're paying their taxes. And we're giving them a little relief. 
Yeah. So, so, Joe, so we, it, be, it could possibly be, a, maybe it would be a TDR. So instead of it yeah. being a TDR, it's, it's, a, it's an interest-only uh, modification. Right. So, Joe, if we think about it from a big picture view, the NPLs are relatively low. You still have relatively high deferrals, and the CARES Act modifications also seem relatively high. But if you thought either of those two buckets were not going to pay you at the end of this deferral term, they would have to be an NPL today, correct? I mean, you're not they postponing moving be, them to NPL. We would not postpone them. If, if, so, if we believe someone's not going to pass, they will be moved to non-performing. Uh, if we believe somebody's not going to pass, then we'd also take a charge. Yeah. A specific, well, we put a specific reserve on it. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. As an example, I won't give the amount so I'll tell you who the client is, but we have one situation where the client is paying, but we don't believe that uh, it's going to end up being good, so that, that has a specific reserve on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. That's helpful. And then, and then to shift directions to the growth side, so uh, we used to talk not that long ago, I think it was actually 2020, of 3 to $5 billion per year with the asset growth target, and you did $23 billion in 2020. How, what is a reasonable target now as we think about Signature Bank in its current form? Well, you know, what, what we talked about, Steve, is that you know, we have the, the ability to grow securities $1 to $2 billion a quarter, the ability to grow loans one to two billion a quarter, that basically sets up to two to four billion in asset growth, you know, per quarter. So you're looking at anywhere from you know eight billion to sixteen billion in growth. Uh, yeah. we, we've we've put in place some very meaningful businesses over the last couple of years um, that will really allow us to 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 drive future growth. Yeah. You know, we brought our we brought on all these new initiatives, which are now full-fledged businesses. We didn't know how quickly they would come to fruition. So the three to five for the year, we didn't realize it was going to be three to five per quarter. Yeah, yep. But I guess what I'm trying to drill down to also, so you grew deposits $23 billion, but loans grew by $10 billion in 2020. And when we think about this mix, is there, an, and I know you said there might be new teams coming on the asset side, but uh, should you expect a loan to deposit ratio, which I think was like 77 percentage range? You, is there enough on the asset side to absorb the deposit verticals all contributing, or, or do you think the loan to deposit ratio from here just continues to trend lower through the year? Thanks. It'll probably trend a little lower initially because we are going to have, we think these two new verticals. Uh, on the back end of the year, the second half of the year, um, so that 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 will mean that we'll do much more asset generation in the second half than we would in the first half. So yeah, that that ratio could be uh, come down slightly. Okay. Great. But we, Thanks, you know, Steve. We, we've been, we've been through cycles, right? And we've seen when when rates rise, right? Deposits tend to find other uses whether it's people building their business or investing in an off-balance sheet, um, you know, investments that can earn them more. And we've seen deposit growth, you know, then um, slow down, right? And that's when we'll ultimately be able to take the current deposits that we have, really deploy them, and maximize our earnings potential. But the important thing, you know, and I think people are losing sight of this a little bit, we grew by about $10 billion this quarter, and we returned 13.5% return to common equity shareholders. Mm-hmm. I mean, what other bank is doing that? Yep. So now imagine putting the cash to use, and what does that do for earnings? Yep. Tremendous okay. amount of earnings power in our balance sheet right now. And we're yep. continuing to drive down uh, the cost of deposits. Like I said, we went from 42 for the quarter to 41 in December to 37 thus far in January. So we have we have a little more room to, to drive that and, and, and create more ROE. Oh, yeah. Thanks for all the color, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Chris McGrady of KBW. Great morning. 
Um, most most of the questions have been uh, answered. Um, just a couple of nitpicky ones. Um, Joe, can you remind us, or Erica, to remind us the, the remaining uh, triple P fees that are uh, scheduled to come through uh, in the next couple quarters? Uh, we haven't really forgiven that much. So, you know, it's a little bit of a guess, but it's got to be around 50, 50 million still that we have to come through. 50? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then on the um, the non-interesting, I'm just going back to that for a moment. Um, a couple quarters back, you used to have a, a, an amortization line that ran through it, um, and there was an offset on the tax line. That seemingly has gone away. Uh, maybe it's being masked by some other um, items, but uh, how do we think about that other other yeah, non-interesting line? We reclassified that at the beginning of the year, so um, you know we took that out of the expense, out of the um, non-interest income line. It was a negative non-interest income component, mm -hmm. and we moved that down into taxes. So that's why our tax rate, our effective rate, bumped up at the time from 25% to 28%. But we also took out the previous years. So when we do, when we're saying about the growth, that growth is uh, apples to apples because we we reclass previous years as well. Okay, but if I'm just looking at that fee, that fee line was call it 24 million bucks this quarter, a little over 20 if you back out the bond gains last quarter. These are kind of a stepped up run rate that's sustainable is what you're messaging. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Our next question comes from the line of Mark Fitzgibbon of Piper Sandler. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning, morning Mark. Just follow-ups to uh, prior questions. Um, I guess I'm curious, do you have any plans for new lending businesses to sort of help sop up some of the liquidity? Yes. We actually have two initiatives that uh, just we're in the midst of discussions but we should have them on board uh, sometime in the next, certainly this quarter, and uh, and then we'll, we'll start seeing the fruits of their labor in the second half of the year. And they're both initiatives are both asset generators. And, and they're scalable right away? Uh, it'll, it'll take them three to six months to get up and running. Um, for sure, and one is a bit more scalable than the other. Um, but you know, realistically, we'll have some impact to the to the fourth quarter numbers, I'd expect, but uh, more so really in 2022, where they'll really be able to ratchet it up. We're not trying to be coy about it. It's just that we haven't brought them on board yet. Fair enough. Um, just uh, Joe, correct me if I'm I'm wrong, but I thought you had said in the past that some of the large deposits coming in in the second half of 2020 might not be that sticky that there were some that maybe were temporarily parked. Do, do you see um, sometime during 2021 some of those, you know, flowing back out? Uh, we, there's some fluff. There's always been, there's always been some fluff. Uh, we had some very large deposits during the year that were class action deposits. We had three, believe it or not, we had 3.7 billion or near, nearly 4 billion of deposits that you don't see in the uh, in the uh, uh, end of the third quarter and end of the fourth quarter because it came in the beginning of the fourth and left during the the, uh, the month of December. So we had another we had another 3.7 billion in deposits, but it was all BDA, and uh, so we saw about four billion flow out. Uh, we, we we expect that there there'll be some fluff. In fact, we expect that when the rates rise. Some of that money will go off balance sheet to a, a new money market mutual funds, but we're okay with that because we don't use capital, and we get a fee for putting it off balance sheet. In fact, uh, it wasn't too long ago we would get three 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 million two hundred and fifty thousand a quarter, and today we're getting less than two hundred thousand a quarter on fee income for off balance sheet. So uh, we expect some of that to, to flow out. It, it, it won't it won't reverse the growth. It, it just slows it down a little. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our allotted time and today's teleconference. If you would like to listen to a replay of today's conference, please dial 800-585-8367 and refer to conference ID number 4079502.
A webcast archive of this call can also be found at www.signatureny.com. Please disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.